Hello, everybody. Can you can you hear us? Yes. Fantastic. Get guessing you. I can see Nick. Hi. How about good? Good morning. Good morning or good afternoon for whoever connects from Europe. Excellent. So we'll just wait another minute for everybody to, to join and then we'll start. Okay, I guess I guess I guess we can go ahead and people will join uh, throughout. So anyway, welcome to our first um, ceremony to announce the, the winners of our first uh, contests, but also to give you an opportunity, you know, to, to meet the team, to meet us, and to hear about Telescope Live and what we do uh, and some st status update. So we'll the idea is to do this every month in a very informal way. So this is why we wanted to do it on on Zoom with, with you joining, you know, as a meeting. Um, and if you want, you know, you can intervene, uh, use the chat um, uh, or even, you know, just interrupt us and ask, and ask questions. Uh, we'll have a, a question and answer session at the very end. So, you know, if you, if you uh, can, you know, do wait for, for the end to ask, um, to ask some um, questions. So the agenda for this meeting and the future ones as well, um, will be similar to, um, to this one. Um, and uh, we have some uh, news uh, from uh, the Telescope Live headquarters. Um, and then we are going to announce the, the winners of the contest. Um, we had a very uh, large number of images for both categories, the one click and the pro data set. So uh, thank you everybody to, you know, for submitting so many, so many images. We had around a hundred uh, images per, per contest. So I, I, I know it's been very hard for the uh, judging panel to, to decide upon the winners. Um, so in between the announcements from, from Adam and, and Nick, uh, we'll have uh, Ian Howard uh, uh, telling us a little bit about the science behind uh, one of the targets uh, that uh, won uh, the contest. Uh, and then, as I said, uh, question time. Um, so I want to start with some um, uh, news from, from, from Telescope Live, and I want to start with some of the issues we've been having recently. Um, if you used two of our Spanish telescopes, SPA1 and SPA3, you might have noticed that not many images are uh, coming through. And this is because we have a strong, um, uh, well, a, a, a serious issue with one uh, software we use. Um, uh, it's the third party scheduling software we use um, which is causing many plans, many plans to, to fail. So we, you know, the solution is to develop a new software that will replace uh, this aging um, uh, telescope control system, but it's going to take some time. So uh, hold on for uh, one or two weeks uh, before we can recover. Um, the second issue we're having in Spain is, is with SPA2. Uh, so if some of you, if some of you have used this telescope, you, you'll see that sometimes we have issues with, with tracking and this is because we're having issues with guiding. Um, and you know, we're, we're still trying to test this and, and, and uh, improve the tracking uh, and weather in the last few months didn't, didn't really help. But now weather is turning better and we should be able to, to, to fix this issue pretty, pretty soon. Um, and then I have an announcement. Um, uh, we're launching very soon a new referral program um, so if um, you are in silver or, or, or gold, uh, you basically be able to benefit from referring users to, to us. Uh, and, you know, we, we've been wanting to launch this program for a long time and now we have it. Um, so the idea is that each one of you will have a promo code, a personal promo code that can be shared uh, with your friends. And um, if your friends join and become subscribers, then you'll get monthly credits uh, for every month that the referred person will be a subscriber. Uh, so you know, if you refer 10 people to us and this will become subscribers, then you'll actually be almost paid for that with credits. And you can use the credits uh, to submit um, advanced requests. Now, the second announcement uh, from today is that we're launching uh, a new telescope. Um, it's G6. It's a Nofisina Stellare uh, RH200. It's a very fast uh, reflector, 20 centimeter reflector. 
Uh, it's got a very wide field of view, uh, 2.6 by, by 2 degrees, um, and it's equipped with a um, FLI uh, microline 16,200. And as with all the other telescopes, we have um, uh, both broadband and narrowband filters. Um, and this will be launched either this evening or uh, tomorrow morning. We're just uh, refining the last details with the calibration frames and it's going to be available for um, to all of you. Okay, so this is it for uh, the quick announcements from the Telescope Live HQs. And uh, we can start with the actual uh, ceremony, uh, the Galaxy Contest. So you know that uh, the, the topic of the month was uh, galaxies. Uh, We're entering the, the galaxy season. So we thought it was nice to, to start with that. And the judging panel for uh, this month are Adam Block uh, from the US, Nick, astrophotographer from uh, Britain, um, United Kingdom, and Ian, who's a professor, emeritus professor of astronomy at, at UCL uh, UK, and all of them have been um, part of our judging panel. So thank, thank uh, Adam, Nick, and Ian again uh, to be part of it. Um, and I guess I'll leave the floor to, to Adam, who will announce the uh, one click observation contest winner. Okay, uh, thank you, Marco. So, uh, but you're gonna still be in control of the screen, right? I will, yes. Okay, so yeah, so the first uh, item is the, the one click observations and uh, we, uh, the, the uh, judges looked at uh, all of those images. There were very many images and uh, it was hard to kind of pick and we had uh, good uh, discussions when we were looking at the images. Um, so uh, the way that I would like to do it this time is I'm basically going to show you both the winners uh, first and second simultaneously uh, because it happens to be the same object. And since it is uh, effectively the same data, what's interesting is that you really get to see the different ways that uh, images are handled. You get to see the way that it's processed differently because these two images certainly show that. So Marco, let, let's go ahead and, and do that. Take a step forward. So uh, on the right, you'll find that uh, the second place winner is the M83 is the, the name of the galaxy. So that's the object. And on the right, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm terrible with names, but I'm gonna try Lionel uh, Padron. His image of M83 we thought was very good. And then there's a, a similarly very good image on the left, which uh, just eked out. We decided to go for it uh, to have the first place by Richard Baer. And these two images are wonderful and we should congratulate these two individuals for working so hard on the data. They have won those uh, 50 credits, which is wonderful for Telescope Live. That's certainly a very valuable commodity. And what I wanted to point out here is something that I think that just an astrophotographer or imagers in general might want to consider, which is that when judges like us who have seen lots and lots of images, when we look at images, the kinds of things that you might want to consider or look for are um, elements of the image. It's not just the detail. We're, you know, we're not just looking for, is it the smallest little detail you can see? That is one element of what makes a, a compelling image, but there are many others. I think one of the more important things to look at when looking at images like this is um, was the data represented in a way where it was the data that was controlling the result or was it the image processor really making the decisions and ultimately deciding what the final rendered image looks like? And I think that that's demonstrated very well here. Imagine that you know, you're out at sea and your ship is rudderless the sails are furled, tempest tossed, you are. That's not the image result that uh, might be the very best, right? It's where you're in control, you know the destination, you're gonna reach your final port and uh, do whatever you need to live your life. Uh, so here in these images that's demonstrated well, we have um, on the right, a, a much more, I would say, um, uh, controlled, version of the data. Uh, one of the things that I think I, I look for in images is that uh, when you look at an image, does it have a self-consistency? In other words, 
if the object of interest lives in a different universe than all the other stars or the background or something, if those are completely different elements, then it seems very disjointed. And in both of these images, uh, though they chose different routes, um, it's self-consistent in both images, the background, the stars, the colors, everything holds together. And so in that sense, we have the uh, an image where you can clearly see all of the detail right down into the core uh, on the right, and it's a wonderful image. And then on the left, the image processor made a very different decision. And uh, the decision by Richard here is to really make the galaxy much more of a luminous creature. Uh, but the stars are also equally luminous and the color representation across the field uh, is equally colored in the sense that uh, there doesn't appear to be that disjointed nature. Uh, and so uh, I think that as judges, we really wanted to highlight as this kind of first example, what it looks like when you have different decisions, uh, but these were conscious decisions. This isn't just the way that the data fell out uh, from these image processors. It isn't just the equipment that did this, as wonderful as the equipment in sight is, uh, credit goes to the image processors for producing images that look like this. So congratulations, guys. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing more images as part of these contests go forward. Excellent. Thank you very much, Adam. And congratulations to, to Richard, Richard and Lionel for uh, being our first winners of this contest. So I'll, I'll pass the floor to, to Ian now, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, M83. Um, Ian, I'll, I'll stop sharing and uh, you, you can get the lead. Thanks, Marco, and congratulations to our winners. Can you hear me okay? That might... That's a, that's a no, isn't it? Yes, we can hear you fine. Oh, you can hear. Sorry, yeah, sorry. sorry. I should have said yes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> let me go back to sharing then. Okay. Uh, yeah, so congratulations to both winners. Uh, as Adam says, two very different images uh, based on the same data. The, I've, I've chosen Lionel's, which was the second place image, only because for my purposes, it, it serves a little bit better. So as you can see, M83 has an NGC number, of course, if you if you go to uh, the Centre de Donne Stellaire, you'll find out that it actually has uh, another 49 aliases, uh, all less well known, except for maybe the Southern Pinwheel. And it came as a surprise to me that it even has a stellar designation as an HD uh, catalog entry. And that's because of the very bright core, which was actually, I think, burnt out in, in both the, the winning entries, but that's because this is a, a starburst galaxy and there's a, there's a nuclear starburst, which is really ramping up the emission right in the middle. And it's a classic grand design spiral seen pretty much face on. Grand design just means uh, it looks like a kind of chocolate box picture of a spiral galaxy with two major uh, spiral arms. Why is that not progressing? Oh, here we go. And just, uh, just for reference, this was an image taken with the VLT, the Very Large Telescope, or one of the VLTs, which is an 8.2 meter telescope. And uh, there's probably a little bit more detail, but I think the telescope live images actually stand up pretty well. And in particular, you can see that even the VLT image has a burnt out core here. And what I wanted to do, just run through, was the fact that these spiral arms we see so magnificently in a, in a galaxy like this are, uh, they're waves, they're wave structures. So they don't represent the same stars going round and round in orbit all the time. Uh, the stars actually pass through the spiral arms, uh, which as I say, represent a, a a wave structure, a density wave. So just as uh, waves, as they roll across the ocean, do not represent exactly the same water all the way, it changes all the, all the time. So the stars and gas that make up the spiral arms change with time. 
the spiral arms are there. Well, it's not really clear if they're there permanently, probably not, but they're certainly long lived structures. And during their lifetimes, material passes through them. And uh, we know that must be the case because if, if it were not the case, then it, as we'll see shortly, the orbital velocities of stars in this galaxy is more or less constant with radius. So the outside stars take a long time. The outer stars take a long time to complete one orbit. The inner stars complete an orbit much more quickly, just as, uh, well, not quite just as, but similar to the way that Mercury goes around the sun faster than Pluto or uh, Uranus or Neptune. And if you think through how that would, uh, what that would result in, it would mean that the spiral arms would inevitably wind up over the course of time. And indeed, they, they, they become amorphous and uh, unified very quickly so that you wouldn't see the spiral arms wouldn't survive. And that's called the winding problem. So it's been clear for a very long time that uh, you can't, that these things must rotate like a Catherine wheel, not like a solar system. And the only way you can accommodate that with orbital motions is as a wave structure. So here's a little bit about, it's just a cartoon uh, showing how that works. So the, the white arc is intended to represent the spiral arm. And in the inner part of the spiral galaxy, the stars actually orbit faster than the spiral arm propagates. So the, the stars and the gas come up behind the uh, spiral arm and then they're compressed within the spiral arm, within this density structure. So that triggers star formation and it triggers star formation across a wide range of masses from low mass stars like uh, the sun all the way up to the most massive stars. And those newly formed stars then emerge from the front of the spiral arm, from the front of the density wave. What actually gives us the appearance of the spiral arm is the most massive stars from that star formation phase because the most massive stars are the hot stars. They're the most luminous stars. As you can see from the caption, there's a mass luminosity relationship. Luminosity scales like something like mass cubed. So if you have a star that's 10 times the mass of the sun, it's a thousand times more luminous than the sun. So it's those stars, the most massive stars that pick out the spiral arm in ordinary optical light and UV light as well. Those are also, the most massive stars are also the shortest lived stars. So they kind of cling to the front of the spiral arm. They don't propagate out continuously because they die quite quickly, as, again, as we'll see shortly. And so the way that the density wave manifests itself in an optical image, such as our winning images today, is as uh, a section of, of blue stars and also the uh, red regions of ionized gas, the H alpha emission from the ionized gas that they ionize. Uh, I thought I'd just uh, throw in something about rotation curves. This is uh, our winning image again, or a second placed image rather, again. And the uh, rotation curve, the so called rotation curve for M83 as observed. So, what we have here is, is the velocity of rotation on the y axis in kilometers per second and radius along the x-axis. And you can see it's uh, the observed value is kind of strange because unlike the solar system, where as you go further and further away from the sun, the planets orbit more and more slowly, the orbital speeds, apart from right in the core, are more or less constant. And that must mean clearly that unlike the solar system, where all the mass is concentrated in the middle, the mass must be more distributed which is no surprise because when we look at a spiral galaxy, we see uh, stars all over the place. However, if we work out what the gravitational effects of those stars are and how they would affect the rotational velocities, we predict something like this, this stellar disk curve here. And we can see that it doesn't account for the observed velocities by quite a, quite a wide margin. I guess, I guess that's a factor of two to three there. Let me just uh, go on. So ooh. this is actually scaled 
so that this radius here of you can see 15 kiloparsecs actually corresponds to about the uh, width or the half width of the image here. So we can see that actually the velocities rise to more or less the edge of the visible galaxy in this image. But outside that, where there's still a lot of material, the curve flattens off. And of course, the answer to this uh, conundrum is that there must be some dark matter that's controlling the velocities. There must be some stuff there that we don't see, stuff that's not stars or gas, but this uh, so-called dark matter. And this was how Vera Rubin first discovered uh, the widely accepted evidence for dark matter in galaxies. The other thing is that uh, this dark matter could be anything. It could be bricks. It could be a uh, huge dark alien spacecraft. Uh, it could be any kind of so-called baryonic matter made up where the mass is contained mostly in the protons and neutrons in principle. But cosmology gives us another handle on how, how much matter there can be in the, in the baryonic matter, the so-called baryonic matter, the, the elements we're familiar with, hydrogen and helium and the so-called metals. And it turns out that that baryonic matter cannot account for the dark matter we observed. So we know that this dark matter must be non-baryonic. It's some weird stuff we've yet to securely identify. I think uh, personally, my personal view on this is, is that it's just going to be some weird particle and sooner or later the particle physicists or the astrophysicists will identify it and it will no longer be dark matter. It will be some named particle just as the neutrino was a predicted weird particle that nobody observed until they observed it. And now the neutrinos are just a regular part of our uh, standard model of uh, matter. So uh, M83 is, is distinguished by having six known supernovae. And there's probably a seventh one that's occurred in the last century that uh, was unobserved in optical light, but which now shows up in uh, in its radio emission. And I think that makes this the Messier object with the most known supernovae. Um, it also has, from radio observations and uh, narrowband observations, there are also some 300 odd supernovae remnants, which is about the same as we have in our own galaxy. Again, uh, a record number as far as I'm aware. And what's kind of interesting is where those supernovae have been where they occurred. So I've marked on here uh, five of those six. The sixth one is actually outside the uh, field of view, but it's in a region where stars are forming. And what you can see is these little red blobs here. This is H alpha emission. So this is nebulosity that's ionized by the hot stars. Again here, material ionized by hot stars. You can see the blue of the hot stars themselves here and here. And in here, well, it looks kind of murky, but what we've actually got is this uh, star, star forming the starburst nuclear region. Uh, so what we can see is that the supernovae have all occurred in spiral arms. And what we saw earlier was that the spiral arms are delineated by the most massive and short-lived stars. So this, this uh, just the spatial distribution of supernovae in the galaxy shows us directly that these so-called core collapse supernovae uh, must be the product of the most massive stars. Otherwise, they, they could very well appear between the spiral arms or just anywhere you like. Um, and this was uh, pretty much the first direct evidence that uh, the most massive stars, the most massive stars become core collapse supernovae. So uh, I didn't want this to develop into a full scale lecture. I think it probably has, but anyway, the takeaways are, that spiral arms are density waves. They're not kind of fixed structures with the same matter in them all the time. Density waves trigger, trigger star formation and uh, particularly the short-lived massive stars, which give rise to the light we see as spiral arms. And those massive stars also give rise to core collapse supernovae. And M83 is a fine example of, of all those phenomena. So I'll hand back to uh, Marco. You should be able to grab that back. Thank you very much, Ian. Let's see if I can share again. Excellent. So thanks again for sharing some insights into M83 and spiral arms and galaxies. Um, 
So I'll pass the floor to Nick now, the, the next uh, bit of uh, the uh, event today is the, 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 the pro data set cost contest um, winners. So um, there are two, two different pictures, these, these two, two different objects this time. So they are separated uh, as, as, um, as planned. So Nick, uh, I'll leave it to you. So. Thanks, Marco. Um, okay, as hopefully you can see on, on the screen, um, our second place winner today is um, the lovely Spiral Galaxy NGC 300 by Dan Croson. And uh, this is an interesting object. Um, initially, it's one of the closest galaxies to us. Um, originally, I believe it was thought to have been part of the Sculptor group of galaxies, which includes the, the famous galaxy NGC 253. But it seems it's actually uh, much closer than that, lying at a distance of about 6 million light years. So it's kind of between us and the, the Sculptor group of galaxies. It's fairly bright as galaxies go, at magnitude 9, and um, it's not too distant similar in size to our Milky Way with a, uh, a diameter of about 90,000 light years compared to approximately 100,000 light years for the Milky Way. It's, um, it's been compared quite regularly to um, the lovely galaxy M33 in Triangulum, and there are a lot of um, overlaps between the two. Um, you can see, uh, if you're familiar with M8, uh, with uh, M33, you can see um, it's got these, these lovely kind of flocculent spiral arms, and I think one of the things that really um, makes a close comparison is just how tight the nuclear region of the galaxy is. As you can see on this image, um, it's almost like a stellar core. It almost looks like a foreground star. And you know, this is good because what, what we look for in, in these um, images that have been um, submitted to, to the um, competition, this first competition on galaxies, is a nice, tight and resolved core. Now, it's not always easy to do that. If, if we compare it to the previous images of M83, the, the core of M83 is so bright that even on 300 second exposures, the core does tend to be slightly overexposed. But with uh, NGC 300, um, as you can see on, on the, our second prize um, winning image by Dan, um, the core is very, um, very star-like. And you know that, that's that also down to good processing. We can see good resolution in the spiral arms. We can see um, uh, the, the clusters of blue stars that are populating the, the spiral arms. We can see um, very well uh, resolved H2 regions. These are the red objects that speckle the spiral arms. And even though this data set um, is, is just in LRGB, it's, it doesn't contain any hydrogen alpha component, that the, the, hydro, uh, the H2 regions are very well displayed and the colors are, are very good. But one thing we, I think the judges having sort of had conversations re regarding these objects uh, and the entries that we've had, um, what, what, what we agree on is that we like to see um, a nice neutral sky background without any form of gradients. And you know, these can come from many sources. So when we're looking at these winning um, entries, you know, we're looking for a, a nice neutral sky background. We don't like to see the sky background jet black. Um, and this, this does come back to, to what Adam was saying previously. Um, personally, when I'm looking at images and when I'm processing my own data, I like to keep the sky background just slightly lighter than black. And that gives you a, a very natural transformation from the object to the sky background. It, it doesn't look like the galaxy has been processed completely separately and independently from the sky background. Th these are the things we like to, to see in, in the images. So, um, you know, this, this, uh, this entry, uh, our second um, winner, um, certainly has all of those capabilities. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, they, they're the reasons why we chose it as, um, as one of the winning entries. So um, great job, Dan. Um, can we go on to uh, the first place um, winner, please, Marco? And this is um, the, the magnificent galaxy uh, sensor, or say NGC 5128. And again, this, is, this galaxy is in a class of its own. I mean, first and foremost, for me as a telescope live user, um, I, I love imaging this target because it's something we can't actually see from the UK even from um, Spain and La Palma, um, which I've visited many times over the years, it's not that high in the sky. 
but it's one it's the fifth brightest galaxy in the sky at magnitude approximately seven um it's slightly smaller than the milky way which i find surprising because these elliptical galaxies do tend to be massive its distance is somewhat uncertain thought to be between 10 and 16 million light years and um it's uh, a very interesting target for astrophysicists. It has um, a relativistic jet, which we, we can't actually image in with the conventional filters that we use. It's, it's very bright in X-rays and um, radar. And it's unlike the, the jet in M83, which telescope, telescope live users have regularly been um, imaging. That is quite easy to pick that out from the, the galaxy. Not really possible, I don't think, in, in uh, NGC 5128. Now, it's an intriguing target, and I'll, I'll certainly get onto the, the processing and everything in just a few minutes, but it's an intriguing target because it's, um, it's a merger of two distinct types of galaxies. A massive elliptical, which you can see on the screen, it has that kind of elliptical shape to it, and um, what's thought to be a spiral, and it's, it's the spiral that's been kind of um, torn apart and gives that diagonal um, object across the, it looks like it's in front of, the, um, the elliptical galaxy. Now, so this is a very interesting target. This, I don't think there's anything really like this in, in the sky. We do see galaxy mergers, but this, this is a very unique object. And obviously it's been a very popular target because it responds well to the one-click observations just because it's so bright, but also to the slightly more detailed and, and longer uh, pro data set. So we've had a lot of, um, of examples of this this image uh, uh, this object sent to us just before i sort of get on to the processing so it's worth bearing in mind that the collision between these galaxies um, you know we can think of them you know a lot of people it's very easy to think of as a train wreck and all the stars kind of colliding and everything but it's, in reality the stars are so far apart in these galaxies that there's really just a kind of effect where the stars tend to pass through pass by each other with very little interaction but um, the gas and the dust, um, it does get um, uh, disturbed. And uh, that's the effect that we're seeing um, on this. And remember, this is just a snapshot in time because this is something that's continually evolving. You know, maybe the, the, the shredded remains of the spiral will escape this galaxy altogether. Maybe it will merge or maybe it'll be pulled back in. So this is just a snapshot in time. And I think for me, that's what makes it one of the most alluring targets in the night sky. And this is, incidentally, as a sort of fledgling astrophotographer, this the, the pictures that David Mailing took, for example, at the Anglo Australian Telescope, which captured the supernova in 1986. Now we look at these in books, and we see images like this taken by that professional uh, level telescope by a very professional sort of photochemist who develops his own techniques to to image the galaxy. Um, you know, we, we grew up looking at these images, and now we can actually take them ourselves thanks to the uh, telescope live platform. So it's absolutely great. Now, as far as this image is concerned, our winning, uh, winning image, we, we compared lots of images that were sent in, but I think what we liked about this was um, something that Adam talked about in one of the M83 images previously, which was this image has a certain luminosity to it. And that's very good because it shows the, um, the diagonal extensions um, from top left to bottom right that, that show the galaxy to be more than just an elliptical blob interacting with a spiral galaxy. So it's a very vibrant image like um, we saw with the M83 um, winner uh, a little while back. We, um, we like the sky background on this. We like to see a good representation of star colors. And that isn't always easy to keep when you're concentrating on processing perhaps just the galaxy itself. So um, we like um, the fact that the, there's really nice um, detail in the dust and um, you can see that you know quite a long way out from the galaxy as well so it's been very very well resolved the sky background um, is is very good and uh, once again it's been kept you know maybe slightly lighter than some people would prefer but personally I really like that because it really shows a natural um, sort of uh, morphing of, of the galaxy into the uh, into the sky background so I think that those all of those reason, reasons taken together have elevated this image just ever so slightly above a lot of the other uh, versions of NGC 5128 that were sent in. So, uh, Fabrizio, uh, congratulations. This is uh, a 200 credit prize. 
and it's the, it's the first place of the uh, pro days are set in our very first um, competition. So congratulations. Okay, I'll hand you back to, to Marco. Thank you very much, Nick, and congratulations to Fabrizio again. Um, so this is the first place of the pro data sets, and some of you might be wondering where's the advanced requests um, contest. Um, and for that, we're actually waiting until next month. And this is because um, with the advanced requests, you need more time to get your images once you submit them. And we decided to, to try for the first time uh, uh, by, by, by giving more time uh, to people to, to get the images. So we will have a, a, another winner next month for the Galaxy contest together with the winners of this month um, contest. Um, so this is just a, a nice overview of the, of the four winners. Uh, some of you have been uh, as asked uh, on YouTube um, um, the uh, yeah what's the what's the subject of next month contest and it's the wide field uh, contest and that means um, simply that the image needs to come from uh, one of our uh, wide field telescopes and we've been debating a bit on what's a wide field telescope but we decided to define a wide field telescope as SPA1, SPA3, AUS2, and these are our Takashi um, 106 telescopes, CHI5, which is a very, very wide field telescope, and also CHI6, which is the new telescope we've, uh, we've launched today. Uh, you don't have many one-click observations scheduled uh, for these five telescopes right now, but we're going to schedule them in the next couple of days. So in the next couple of days, we're gonna have a new round of uh, one-click observations for the next couple of months, which will include a lot um, of, uh, well, many of these telescopes. Um, right, so this is this is the end of the event, really. And uh, if you have questions, uh, people here on, on, on Zoom or on, uh, on YouTube, please uh, feel free to ask. Uh, hey, I hey, Mark, hey, Marco, would you mind if I, follow something that uh, Ian was showing before, because I'll never have another chance to do this. <laughs> it's, it's a segue that just won't happen. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So while you're gathering some questions. Um, Can I go back to any picture? You actually, no, I was going to share my screen this okay, time. Go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you. I uh, think I, I can't until some, yeah, there you go. Uh, so. No, I'm on the I don't know what that is. So no, hang on. I, I'm sharing, right? <laughs> it's not what I want to share. Gosh, there's a ton of stuff here, but it's not the one. This one. Can you see that? So this is um, uh, Ian uh, was talking about the stable way in which you can form spiral structure in galaxies. And uh, this is an old, old technique. Um, I wrote a computer program that simulates a spiral structure by using two or three very simple rules. It's kind of like Conway's life version of uh, generating spiral structure in a spiral galaxy. The rule is that you form stars by triggering uh, you know, supernova or something in a galaxy. And then through differential rotation, um, you shift or rotate the disk and then any region that had formed stars might, might probabilistically trigger regions next to them to also form stars. And by doing so, that wave of star formation in a differentially rotated disk ends in spiral structure. And so if I press play here, hopefully you can see that those rules when applied make something that looks like a spiral galaxy. Now it's a, it's a simulation, it's, it isn't, it, it's superficially, uh, it contains some element of what spiral structure in galaxies is like. It does not model a true galaxy in any way, but it's easy to make. And I just wanted to show what that looks like by simple rules. You, know, you can generate something that looks like a spiral galaxy. Have you seen this before, uh, Marco? Uh, no, I've not seen this um, this kind of simulation before. No. Yeah, so the, I'm, uh, this is being computed in real time right now. Um, uh, tens of thousands of little you know cells, basically. So this is called a 
cellular automaton where you, um, you know, you just specify rules for every single, in, you know, it would be cloud of the galaxy in this case, every single cell or pixel, um, depending upon its neighbors, you determine what happens in the next round and you iterate and it generates what looks like a spiral galaxy. There you go. Say thank you. I just never get the chance to show that. So I wanted to show. All right. That. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Okay. I don't think we've got many questions. The only one was uh, from Jim asking if you're allowed to submit more uh, than one image per, cap per category uh, per month uh, for each contest. And the answer is yes. And uh, I'm sorry if we haven't been very clear at the beginning, but you can submit as many images as you want uh, for uh, a given contest. Uh, and the judges you know, will evaluate them without uh, any bias on the number of images you, you submit. Um, okay, this is from Glenn. And this is for a, a question for the uh, judges. I would like to know what the judging, what's the judging criteria would be when we get to narrow band. And I guess with the new contest, the wide field contest, we'll have uh, quite a few narrow band images. So who wants to answer that? Adam, well, I, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pre-say what I'm gonna judge by now. You'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> Nick, do you want to <laughs> give any hint around that? No, I'm I'm not sure actually. <laughs> it's made me stop and think. Um, I th I think with narrow band, um, because um, we're working with a forced color palette, and you know, universally that would be the Hubble palette. Um, there is a lot of uh, user input to that, so it's difficult to kind of narrow that down. I think. I don't know, it's difficult to say. I think we'll know it when we see it, I suspect, yeah. um, because yeah. you know, the Hubble palette, when you first combine those three images together into that, that, um, that uh, channel order, SHO, that's the Hubble palette. But so many people go so far beyond that, including myself, by um, starting to adjust the uh, the color palette that we use, and I, you know, I think that's that's absolutely fine. I think you know the Hubble telescope people do that as well. Um, so it's difficult to pin that down. So I won't say too much because uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that well. I, I think that that self consistency thing, though, whatever those choices are, as long as it's not some you know collage or patchwork of of image processing you know, in components, whether it be the way the noise is handled, the colors, the details, the contrast, so on and so forth. I think a self-consistency. So it looks like it is, you know, a, a thing, not, not some combination of many things. Yeah, and I, I just concur. I think the comments that were made for the uh, broadband imaging that we've been looking at this round clearly apply, you know, you, you want everything to look right. And I agree with Nick. I mean, one of the things that's easy to get wrong is the palette, is the color balance in particular. So that would be something I'd be looking out for. Okay, and, and what about art versus scientific accuracy? What about it? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any strong opinion around that? Well, I, uh, um, I'm, you know, I talked about this in during the judges section, but one of the things that um, the, uh, one of the things that I think that strikes me is the the idea behind selective processing versus global processing. Um, so the more artistic things is if you know if you wanted the spiral arm of some galaxy to be brighter, where you really wanted some nebula to be red instead of blue. That's, that's just pure art, right? Um, so you're just making a decision that you want it that way, not because the data, it was anything that was in the data that was saying that it would, should be a certain brightness, a certain color, a certain contrast. So the selective processing, I, uh, I personally don't like that much because that's easy. It's harder to find ways to process an image where you can apply more global 
It could be that, you know, the processing that you do is based on a threshold. It might be based on a color um, and that's using masks and things. That's fine. But when you can tell that someone literally brushed yeah. an effect, be a color or a contrast or whatever it is, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't excite me. So would, would you agree that it's okay to use masks, but if you're using brushes, you've probably gone too far. Um, I wouldn't be, I'm, uh, I'm a little more open in the sense that there are artifacts that, that are in an image that if you just need to remove them and you oh, had sure. to brush them, yeah, that, that's, that's fine. But I guess I'm talking more about the data sans artifacts. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm not a big fan of that. Yeah, cosmetic correction is okay, but yeah, cosmetic, cosmetic enhancement is... Yeah, I steer away from that. But like I said, masks, I think, are okay when they are based on a rule. It could be based on a threshold. It could be based on a color. It could be based on um, some other creative things I can think of. But, um, but right, yeah, if you're just kind of paint, you know, you want to make something brighter. <laughs> that, that's easy. That's easy. Excellent. Thank you. So I guess that, that answers that. Um, okay, so one very last question, um, a bit technical around the rules. Uh, assuming that we add data from uh, advanced requests to enhance one-click observations, will the following result be accepted in the advanced request category? Um, and I would say no. So if you are submitting a, 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 an image for the advanced request contest, uh, that needs to come, you know, the data for that needs to come from an advanced request um, and vice versa. If you're submitting uh, for a one click um, observation contest, you can combine multiple one clicks, but you can combine an advanced request with that. And this is to keep the, the three contests uh, fair and separated because not everybody can access uh, every, every contest. So we want to keep the three uh, um, separate. Okay, so I guess um, we're out of questions. Uh, so thank you very much um, um, to everybody for, for joining. Congratulations um, to, to the winners. Um, I see, Sean, you've asked something else, but I'll reply to you uh, privately. And um, well, thank you again and see you, see you next month. Bye-bye.